Elizabeth Smith Friedman hated the idea of being a boring housewife. How did this former teacher go on to save the lives of 8,000 people aboard the Queen Mary and become Al Capone's number one enemy? She also went on to be a key player in ending World War II. Find out all of this and more next on Technically a Conversation. Greetings, super friends. Welcome to another edition of Technically a Conversation. Here, we take turns sharing something new we've learned with each other and hope that you find it interesting too. I'm one of your co-hosts, Cicela. Joining me as always is Jose. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good. How was your week? Good. You know, I'm, I'm not a big sports fan, but I have to admit that halftime show during the <gasps> Super Bowl was probably the best halftime show ever. Definitely say more. I fucking agree. I was like, what? It looked so freaking cool. They had all the heavy hitters that you wanted to see. It was excitement from fucking beginning to end. Oh my God. And Mary J. Blige, she looked beautiful. Like, I swear that lady doesn't age. No, she still looked great. And her voice was still fantastic. Oh my God, her voice. She's on my bucket list. I want to see her so badly. <laughs> she just put out a new album too, so. Oh, cool. Maybe she'll do some touring. I remember my sister saying, man, check out her thighs. And I was like, thick thighs save lives, girl. <laughs> I never understood that <laughs> saying of thick thighs save lives. <laughs> um, I can see like thick thighs turn eyes or something. I don't know, maybe something like that. But I don't know how they're saving lives. But sure, we'll go with it. Yeah, no, I was already sold with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Of the rappers are probably my two favorite. I didn't even know 50 Cent was going to be part of it. And when he came out doing, in the club and whatever, I, I don't know the lyrics. I can't understand what he says. But I mean, I love, I love 50 Cent and I love like that song. So I was super excited. Yeah. When he was doing that like vampire bat thing hanging, I was like, hold up. <laughs> What's happening right now? It was so badass. Poor dude, though. He was all red from the blood just rushing to his head. <laughs> Well, how long had be, had he been hanging there? Pobrecito, I'm surprised he remembered the lyrics. Since the first inning or the first, whatever, first round or whatever they you call it in baseball or whatever. Baseball. <laughs> so bad. We ready for some shout outs? I'm ready. Super friends, Elena, Erica. The queens. The super, we're going to call them super friends of the year. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And not just them, but we're also adding Laura G. Thank you so much. Poltergeist OD. Hell yeah. Thank you. Stephen B. What? Heck yes. Thank you guys all for sharing our posts on your social medias. Thank you so much. We do appreciate it. And speaking of the queens, I spoke already with Elena and Erica about that um, thing that we have. We have a little surprise planned and they're both super down. <gasps> this is cool. I'm very excited. You guys should be too, listeners. Yeah, so expect a little surprise sometime in March. No, sometime in April, because Erica won't be in El Paso until April. That's cool. It'll be it'll be fun. It gives us more time to plan. Definitely. Elena left us a five star review. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elena. All of these things absolutely help us. Yes, we really do appreciate it. That definitely helps us to get noticed and to be recommended by the infamous algorithm. Yeah, yeah. All hail to the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> Quick reminder, we still have a contest for a chance to win your very own, very sexy, technically a conversation t-shirt. What do they have to do, Jose? Just leave us a review. Send us a screenshot. We're at Greetings TAC on all the socials. And that will enter you into a contest to win a sexy, technically <laughs> a conversation t-shirt. That's right. Diving into our topic, let me ask you a question. Are you one that can keep secrets? Mm, I'd like to say that I am, but just if something is really juicy, I got to spill that tea sometimes. Really? Do you? Okay. Do you at least spill it to somebody who has nothing to do with that other person or something? 
Normally, yes. Oh, okay. That's good. I am also very much a vault when it comes to other people's secrets. I will say, though, like when I plan a vacation with my daughter and I intend to surprise her, like the day of, you know what I mean? Like it always sounds like really fun in theory to just be like, pack some shit. We're going to go somewhere to Vegas today or something. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds really fun. Although Vegas with a child, probably not as fun, but you get the idea. I always wanted to do that. And I'm just like, I can't. I'm like so excited to like share the news. That's where I'm, I'm not really a vault, but you know, whatever. Yeah. I can't keep any secrets about myself. Like if I have something exciting to say, like I tell everybody. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. You're like, guess what? I don't have gonorrhea anymore. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I finally got my third penile injection oh, and no. Uh... <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that was way. That was wow. Okay. But I probably started it. I can't even blame you. <laughs> yeah, that was all your fault. That was me. <laughs> you led me down that dark path. I know. Diving on in. <laughs> The month of March is Women's History Month, so I thought it would be good if we got acquainted with a woman. More people should definitely know. I know I certainly didn't know of her until I started researching this. And the information that I took was all from a PBS documentary. It was called The Code Breaker. And an article on History.com titled The Female World War II Code Breaker Who Busted Nazi Spy Rings. What? Do I have your attention? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now that you have a hint of today's conversation topic, let me just spill all the beans, right? All the way. We're going to talk about this badass lady. Her name is Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Being that Valentine's Day was just on Monday. There's also a cutesy little love story embedded in the story. Two fur. Yeah. She was, in fact, a legendary codebreaker. This lady foiled carefully detailed Nazi plans, decoding thousands of messages for the U.S. government. And if that's not exciting enough, big-time mobsters also had a hit for her. What? As the kids say these days, you know you made it to the big time when you have haters. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, I think it was Taylor Swift that said, uh, haters gonna hate, so. Oh my God, look at you quoting (laughs) Tay-Tay. So proud. (laughs) <laughs> Even my daughter. <laughs> of all things uh, to be proud of me of. That was very strange. Yeah. I was like, wait, what? That even threw me off. You got to remember code breaking wasn't even a thing back then. She kind of had to do this all on her own. There wasn't a course she could take. So we're all going to uncover how she became this legendary code breaker boss bitch. Sorry. It was probably like a little harsh, but I had to throw the bitch in there because I like alliteration. <laughs> To start, imagine the bustling city of Chicago in 1916. Elizabeth had just moved to escape a boring life that surely would have awaited her if she stayed in her small hometown in Indiana. She didn't want that boring life. In fact, she disliked even her last name, Smith, because she felt it implied someone very, like, ordinary. Um, She wanted to stand out, and she wanted... Anything but ordinary. Quick aside to say that we have some super friends that I personally know that have the last name of Smith who are very cool chicks, far from boring. So I just thought, you know, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> Those were <laughs> how she felt. <laughs> Back to Elizabeth. She was the youngest of 10 kids. That's a big family, which sounds like a fucking party to me. <laughs> Elizabeth loved to read books. She loved poetry. She even wrote her own poetry. Her dad was a Civil War vet who didn't have a great relationship with her, mostly because he was very vocal when he disagreed with her going to college when she asked him for college money. He was of that mindset back then where he didn't think women should further their education after high school. Astute and persuasive Elizabeth convinced her dad to loan her the money anyway. But sadly, he said, yes but at a 6% interest. Mm, Thanks, Dad. Sounds like my dad. (laughs) Oh, and mine. That's okay. Well, no, I think I had to pay for my own. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I paid for my own college too. Yeah. See, we kind of had it just a little worse or better, depending on how you think about it. (laughs) Very true. She studied Shakespeare where she fell in love with language. He did have almost 32,000 words in his vocabulary where the average adult 
English speaker only has about 20,000. Can thou believe that? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I have about 10,000, if that many, so. But we probably have 5,000 in Spanish, so, you know. There you go. Take that system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after graduating, she got a teaching job. There really wasn't a whole lot like for women to do. Sadly, that only lasted a year because she found it really boring and she wanted more excitement. Exactly what that was, she really didn't know, but she knew she had to find a job and find it fast. So she took a whole week looking for jobs and every day she went out looking for something and she couldn't find anything. Much to her dismay, she knew she had to return to her small hometown because she was broke and she didn't have a job, which is kind of funny. Like, I think this is when our Mexa people would be like, all right, this is time to start selling oranges by the highway. (laughs) That's how we do it. I thought you were going to say she sounds like a typical millennial, but. No. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm kidding. I have a lot of millennial friends. Yeah. Oh, I do too. (laughs) (laughs) Since she surrendered to the idea of returning home, she decided to treat herself (laughs) to an outing at the library in the city. Make note of it because this is actually where fate meets her in that library. She wanted to see Shakespeare's first folio. It was printed in 1963 and it was there at the library. As she's gazing at it, the library noted her admiration for it. And she mentioned to her that there was an odd wealthy man who comes in looking for someone to help with his project. And this project is actually what sets her life forever in motion towards history. This odd wealthy man, he was convinced that Francis Bacon actually wrote Shakespeare's works and that this was all told in like secret messages. I find that kind of interesting that like this wealthy men are odd, right? Like aren't all wealthy men odd? Like Elon Musk, Willy Wonka, they're all odd. Speaking of your boy, Big E. Big E, what is happening with that boy? Yeah, you didn't hear he um, proclaimed that he made an $8 billion donation to charity. Oh, <gasps> no, I didn't. Yeah, well, apparently he was challenged by uh, Melinda and Bill Gates prior to them divorcing. So he uh, proclaimed that he was donating $8 billion to charity. Although it's kind of sus because he never said what charity he was donating it to. I think he's donating it to SpaceX or to Tesla personally until i see the receipts <laughs> that would be i mean i guess that would be too mutually beneficial but then that's not even like it's not even a good deed anymore <laughs> that's re- oh well anyway just thought i had to bring that up since you brought up biggie biggie <laughs> not biggie smalls at all oh. <laughs> <laughs> So this man, George Fabian, he was a wealthy industrialist. He was quite forward as the PBS doc that I was watching said that his first words to her were, quote, would you like to come out to Riverbank and spend the night with me? I wait! (laughs) Like, que (laughs) huevos! This man has balls. In fact, I think that also means that he invented the pickup line. You heard it here first. He definitely invented that. (laughs) (laughs) It was started in (laughs) Chicago. (laughs) She didn't even know what to say because no one had been so bold with her ever. He simply picked her up from the elbow and led her out the door and they got on a train. So that was also a successful pickup line, mind you. Before she realizes it, she's at his huge estate. It's on 350 acres in Geneva, Illinois. He has so much money. He would just sometimes go find these incredible minds of like science and tell them, go be spectacular, make breakthroughs. Dude, this sounded pretty dope. Like it sounded like he was just like, let your mind like run free like a gazelle. (laughs) And you just give him a bag of money. Exactly. Very Willy Wonka. I'm telling you, it's so weird. (laughs) (laughs) In order for Elizabeth to help out with his project that the librarian had mentioned, she had to first learn... Baconian coding that encoded messages. And this like really thrilled her. In very basic terms, every letter of the alphabet had its own combination of five letters. So basically, A, 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 all five A's, that would translate to letter A. And then like A, 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 B would be like B, for example. And uh, they would have to look for real subtle changes in the font 
or like maybe in like the typeset. And they thought these were signaling parts of the hidden messages. So they would like uncover what that letter was and then they would, you know, see if there was like a hidden message. It just sounded like a grown up game of like treasure hunting or something like that. Like the Da Vinci Code before the Da Vinci Code. Right, exactly. And she had to like painstakingly go with like a, a not a microscope, the little handheld. Um, magnifying glass. Yeah, magnifying glass. And she would spend hours, but she had that patience and the non-ADHD mind to, to go through all of that. In the same project, she met William Friedman. He was also a hobby photographer who later became her husband. Aw, cute beginning of their love story. There were several photos of just her, so it seems like he was really taken by her pretty quickly. It was rumored that when he was asked how he got into cryptology, that he would reply with kind of like a devilish smile, and he would say that he was seduced into it. Ooh, cute. <laughs> they worked across from each other every day. He was really nerdy, and he brought his math background and she really had that master of language, so they would tag team, and together they really uncovered the whole thing, the whole thing of the, the project. Ultimately, they both agreed that there wasn't anything that came out of the project besides their cute story, but uh, they ended up leaving the Riverbank estate, and they ended up getting married in Chicago. This was also a very Romeo and Juliet-style love story because their families were really, really different from each other. And uh, like she had a Quaker background, his parents were, um, they were Jewish and their, his parents were very vocal. They did not approve of her in the least, but they did it anyway, all because they were in love. A month before they got married, uh, the USA got involved in World War II, which really sent the radio airwaves super, super busy with like secret messages. They could easily be intercepted. Sadly, the U.S. had no code breaking agency. No NSA, nothing like that. So George Fabian, the rich, wealthy man, he established the very first code-breaking team in 1918, and he puts Elizabeth and William as the leaders. A woman to lead was something really, like, just super heavily doubted. It looked bad. It was like suggesting... Stevie Wonder to lead you on a Grand Canyon tour. Like people were really <laughs> thinking this was probably not a good idea. The Navy, State, and Justice Departments were sending thousands of messages for decryption to them. Meanwhile, they really didn't have any training, no one to help them through with this. It was quite the baptism by fire. The couple started learning a crap ton. I have a cool question for you. What is the difference between a cipher and a code? One of them is a marsupial. Yeah. And the, no. <laughs> Blue eyed marsupial. Final answer. Go. <laughs> I don't know, actually. Okay. I will tell you after our break. This show is part of the Pro Democracy Podcast Coalition. It's a group of over 100 podcasts that have pledged to spread the word about the state of American democracy. We're partnering with the nonpartisan group Represent Us to promote efforts to protect the freedom to vote and to pass laws that'll make our government truly inclusive. America's democracy faces urgent threats, but there are ways we can build a fairer path forward together. Visit represent.us slash podcast to learn more. All right, and we're back, lovelies. So. You had a little extra time to think about a cipher versus a code. I did not think of that during the break. Okay, great. No, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> you did give me an answer, so that's okay. A code is when you take a word and replace it with another word. For example, it's kind of like when someone has said that phrase before, like the eagle has landed. <laughs> like, you know what the words mean, but obviously this is meaning like, Maybe someone important entered the building or something like that. It's like those secret service phrases is what I think of. <laughs> and a cipher is when letters are changed. So messages are completely unreadable. Oh, like a cipher. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Elizabeth was awesome at spotting patterns and text. Once they hit the ceiling of learning, 
they still pushed it even further and they started inventing their own way of breaking codes. I mean, this dynamic duo, they broke every single cipher that came in from the Department of Justice. They documented their breakthrough and they established the principles of cryptology. And they eventually tied it to mathematics. They actually really did change the idea of it being a field of language to actually being a field of statistics. They were training the first generation of code breakers for the U.S. government. And they loved it so much that there were hidden codes everywhere. Even the photo of the first class picture. If you look at the first class picture, we'll have it in the show notes. It looks like a badly timed photo because some people are like, they're all facing in different directions. Some people are facing the camera, which is what usually people do. But other people are facing to the side. It's just super weird. But the Freedmans actually told them how to pose. And every person stood for a letter in the Baconian bilateral cipher. So for example, the people that were looking off to the side were actually the letter B. And the people that were looking ahead were the letter A. It spelled out knowledge is power. And not with letters, but with people. How fucking cool is that? That's very cool, actually. I thought it was so neat. Six months into the war, the government saw the need for its own cipher bureau in D.C. And work was starting to dwindle for the freedmen's because the government was starting their own, right? And uh, William signed up for war so he can go be a code breaker in Europe. And Elizabeth wanted to go, too, because this was like her work. This was her calling. And she couldn't go because she was a woman. So she felt really robbed. And especially because she taught him. And he could go, but not her. Like, that's a little bit dick, right? That's very fucked up. Yeah. So she was alone at Riverbank, just writing to her husband in those letters. She wrote that the wealthy man was starting to proposition her. This guy was like super forward. He was like indecent proposal before indecent proposal. (laughs) He's like, hey, girl, come crack the code over here in my pants. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Gross. William got really upset when he found out that he was making passes at her. And William called him, quote unquote, a nameless rascal. What? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really cute. What a scoundrel. I'm so using this like nameless rascal. This is fucking hilarious. <laughs> they left Riverbank when William finally came back from the war and he got a really good job. And it was still breaking codes. This is still 1921. She was also offered a job breaking codes. Grab your popcorn because here's where some shit goes down. She was offered half his pay. What? Do they not know that this is a fucking person who taught him? Anyway, after she was working there for a year, she said enough of this shit and left. I'm sure that was probably even in code. And she was probably like, you look at me like a plain tortilla chip when I'm really a spicy Dorito nacho. You nameless rascal. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Elizabeth ended up having a baby girl in 1923. Soon thereafter, she had a son. And at this point, you know, she was a mother. And she really thought that her code-breaking days were behind her until it literally came knocking at her door. Coast Guard visited her house personally, stating that there were a ton of messages that were being intercepted, but they were so hard that no one could break them. So they were pleading for her help. This was in time of prohibition, which made mobsters get really creative about selling the alcohol, you know, the bootlegging. Not to mention, it was a rough time with all kinds of murders going on between all the gangsters, and also they were killing anyone in the way of making them money. The liquor was coming in from Europe to feed our black market, and the Coast Guard was supposed to catch these people that were making the exchange, but they simply could not. Coast Guard had 200 ships to guard 5,000 miles of coastline. The rum runners had like huge vessels and they had small boats. I mean, they were just outnumbered and they were really highly organized. Of course, she did have to go back to work. She wanted to do her duty. And in the first three months, she alone decoded two years worth of messages, the ones that were supposedly super hard that no one could decode. Tell me that's not like fucking super badass. Yeah, hopefully she got a huge raise for that too. Right, this is exactly what I'm saying. And it was just her and her secretary. 25,000 intercepts a year, dude. This is insane. 
She also started to develop strategic intelligence. That was not even a thing until her. She gathered key intelligence like who the ship owners were, when were they meeting, where the ship is docked, where is it leaving from, all the details. Without her and, you know, all her good information, all these details would have just completely been gone. Who else was going to do it if not her? The government allowed her to create her own code breaking unit that was first run by a woman. She was finally given that raise and the title was called Crypt Analyst in Charge, which seems kind of cool. It does. Sounds pretty metal. It does sound pretty metal. How superhero of her, because she was like basically fighting crime by day. And then she was like this loving wife and a mom by night. (laughs) She was also a key witness in the court trials of the largest rum runners in the world. She had all the details from manufacturers to the names of speakeasy distributors. They even supplied Al Capone. When she testified against the mobsters and the criminals, their attorneys came in from this strategy, like making her look like she was just crazy and maybe she was like a witch for like breaking these codes. And she got so frustrated that she asked the judge for a blackboard and chalk and she started teaching them code breaking in court. (laughs) This was the slam dunk for these criminals to be put away. Everyone was talking about this woman who brought these criminals to justice and then her husband was starting to have mental issues. So her career is basically soaring, and then her husband's kind of like mentally declining. Elizabeth described these mental declines as like a mood swings. She knew that something from work must have been upsetting him, but of course she didn't know anything because he was working top secret army intelligence. So in terms of difficulty, it sounds like these codes went from like, ching out, that's hard, right? (laughs) Like shit, that's hard, to like whole new levels of like, Yes, that chingadera que, like, what are we going to do with this kind of stuff? So it sounds like he really couldn't talk about it and really got to him. He had a complete breakdown. He checked himself into the Walter Reed Psychiatric Hospital. Every day for three months, she went to see him, which he later said was the sole reason he was able to get out. Again, how cutesy, you know, this is a cute part of their love story. Unfortunately, he was never quite the same after that, even though he did get out. This is still World War II time after Pearl Harbor. Her team shifted from Coast Guard to the Navy. But now she had to be second in rank because the Navy had this stupid rule that women could not be in charge of men. So she was really frustrated because this guy who was in charge was not as good and just not as well versed. Uh, So what they had to do was they had to monitor communication from a Nazi spy ring in South America And the communication was going back and forth between the German high command. And she got so good, she could decrypt messages in all kinds of languages. Japanese, German, she didn't care. It was like a cake for her. She uncovered that the messages were telling locations of U-boats in the Atlantic. In March 1942, she decrypted a message regarding the Queen Mary. And it was carrying all these supplies. Adolf Hitler offered a quarter of a million dollars to the U-boat captain who could take out the Queen Mary. But thankfully, she was so quick. She decoded the message. They got the information to the Queen Mary captain, and he was able to outmaneuver their attacks, saving 8,000 people on the ship. And then they were able to sink the U-boats out there. The crazy thing is that Brazil started arresting the Nazis, which was like the worst idea because now they're tipped off that their messages are being intercepted. They should have waited a little bit longer and they got tipped off because J. Edgar Hoover wanted all the glory. Ultimately, uh, what ended up happening was these Nazis were arrested and it went quiet for a little bit, but they started sending more Nazis back into South America and they started chattering up again. But now the ciphers were a lot harder to break because, you know, they found out that they were being intercepted. She was able to get a break when there was 28 messages that were all sent in the same key, allowing her to pick up on patterns. And she ultimately broke the code again. Nazi threat in the West was finally eliminated. It never came back up, all due to her. When these others had like machines, she did all of this with pencil and paper. It was such a feat that I think like she should have been celebrated in like all these Western countries. But she couldn't even tell her husband because 
she had this oath to secrecy. J. Edgar Hoover once again took all the glory, erasing her and her team from all the official records. When the war ended, she was 54. She knew that her generation of code breaking was a thing of the past. And for the rest of the love story, her husband had a few heart attacks and he was still battling depression. And it was so bad that he couldn't even start writing. And she would literally take his hand in her hand in his hand while she would have him pick up the pencil and help him start writing. And then once he kind of got like a head start, he could finally do his work. But that was how, sh- how cute and how wonderful she was to him. Was that due to the depression or to the diminished mental capacity that he had? That was due to the depression. Basically, she helped create the science of code breaking. She died in 1980. And here's the part that's like really upsetting is that she struggled financially near the end of her life. This woman without her, our world here in the Western countries would look very different if it was not for her. And she was struggling financially like, damn, like after she saved the world, basically, (laughs) Like mama couldn't even buy herself a new set of wheels because she couldn't have, she didn't have the money, you know? I mean, that's how I would want to celebrate anyway. (laughs) Yeah, it's fucked up. You would think that she would be getting a pension from the government for the rest of her life. You would think, but fucking Hoover anyway. (laughs) But she took it to her grave. She never told anyone, her kids, not her husband, no one. All her records and everything she did was locked away for 62 years, and it was finally declassified in 2008. Wow. Yeah, this is, that's the end of our learning story here. That's pretty cool, right? That is, yeah. She sounded like a badass, so I'm going to tell you that. She did get a life that was anything but ordinary, I will say that. Yeah, I had never heard of her. I was very familiar with Alan Turing and the, um, I want to say the Enigma machine that he created to solve some of those codes and ciphers and stuff, but I had never heard about her. I think, um... There was even a st- uh, a movie about the one with the Enigma. I just can't remember which movie it was. Yeah, it was with Benedict Cumberbatch. Yes, it was. I don't remember the name still. I think it was called the Enigma Machine or something. I, I don't know. I could be making that up. Oh, no. Don't tell me. It was like right on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, my God. Speaking of mental decline. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. You've done it again. You've learned another cool story that you can chat about with the kids or some friends. We hope you've been entertained by our chat and join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review, tell a friend, subscribe wherever you're listening to podcasts. Yeah. (laughs) Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all the socials at GreetingsTAC. Email us at greetingstac at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail, 915-317-6669 if you have a story to share with us. You will need to crack any ciphers to leave us a voicemail. (laughs) Or you can try to make us decode some stuff. What? That'd be fun. (laughs) 